According to the New York Times, most of the world lacks access to safe, affordable, and timely surgical care. This impacts low and lower middle income countries the worst, where nine out of 10 people cannot access basic surgical care. Tonight, we meet the founder of an organization with a mission of performing surgery free of charge for underserved individuals, especially children. It's good to have you here. From Los Angeles, this is KLCS PBS. Welcome to Everybody with Angela Williamson, an innovation, arts, education, and public affairs program. Everybody with Angela Williamson is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. And now your host, Dr. Angela Williamson. Dr. Larry Nichter, it's so great to have you here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. First of all, thanks for having me. What a pleasure. I grew up in upstate New York, near the Adirondack Mountains, early as a child and later in uh, late middle school, moved to Eastern Long Island and then did some training in, in Boston. Um, and I, I grew up in a middle to upper middle class um, background. And then in my senior year of high school, my dad died suddenly without a will. And I became an emancipated uh, minor at age 17 and was sort of on my own because I had two siblings that you know my mom had to take care of. Uh, and she was a housewife at the time. She later went on to get her doctorate, but that's a different story. Um, uh, and so I really uh, you know, had to fend for myself. I was going to Boston University, which was an expensive private school, a couple months later, uh, which I did, but I had to you know, work two or three jobs every day. Um, and I really never took education for granted. College was not a social experience for me. Um, I, I learned the value of everything and just um, how important it is to have a life with a steep learning, learning curve. I think experiences um, and how you react to those experiences are what shape who you are as a person. I mean, that sort of not only tells your life story and its selections, but also where you're heading. I always think that experience tends to add the element of commitment to your ambition and, and where you'll end up. So I was interested in everything. Uh, I was a philosophy major in college and psychology and biology minor just because I love that. Um, and I realized um, I really enjoyed helping other people. And it just sort of led to medicine. I never knew I wanted to be a doctor till very late. Um, and then in medicine, everything I rotated through, I loved. Everything was great. Um, but surgery gives you the unique ability to fix a problem and see results immediately. So there's a lot of quick gratification that comes with it. And when I went through general surgery way back then, which was a, quite a while ago, um, it really was general surgery. There's, it's hard to be a general surgery unless you're in a small town. You're specialized into a colorectal surgeon or a thoracic surgeon or a GI surgeon or uh, you know all those sorts of things. And so only plastic surgery and pediatric surgery allowed you to operate on every part of the body, keep your learning curve incredibly steep. Um, and I went into, into uh, I selected plastic surgery, but I first became board certified in, in three things before I got there, general surgery and completed a program at UCLA and um, plastic surgery, University of Virginia, and hand surgery there, and, and then went to become a, a professor, and actually the, one of the first professors at USC and helped uh, start that program that grew at the time to the largest in the country. I'm seeing a trend with you. You start undergrad, you have three subjects that you're studying, you yeah. know, majors, and then you move on to medical school and you d choose three separate areas here. Mm -hmm. And so how does that shape Dr. Nictor, as I saw one of the most compassionate doctors voted several years in a row. How does that shape who you are there? Well, I left one detail out, and that is right after uh, uh, college and part of my master's uh, degree, I took a year off and hitchhiked around the world with a backpack. Uh, you know, it was a very tumultuous time back then. The Vietnam War and uh, you know, all those things were happening. I thought our country was a terrible country to live in, and you know I was, you know, protesting. 
And boy, all it took was just going out of the country, and I traveled only in developing countries throughout Africa and India and, and across in the Middle East on my own with a backpack and a thumb. Uh, I realized within weeks what a wonderful, incredible, privileged country we, we live in. And I thought that I really wanted to give back as much as I, I could um, going forward. So that shaped a lot of, um, I, I never forgot how people live and what health, how we take health for granted. So th that one aspect for that just over a year made a huge difference in my life. And that huge difference that it's, you said it's only a year of your life, but let's talk about that experience and what you did 20 years ago to change surgery a across the world. I sought the first opportunity to go overseas, and I went with several different nonprofit organizations uh, to to operate on on, on on kids, mainly with reconstructive deep problems, cleft lips, cleft palates, burn contractures, problems like that, hand injuries, a lot of post-trauma reconstruction. And I realized that when we got back, there's the only question they want to hear is the only metric of success for that trip for that organization was, how many kids did you operate? How many, how many surgeries did you do? And so we operated as fast as we could. We'd operate for 16 hours a day, but there was no training. There was no development or, or capacity that was there. And I started analyzing. Oftentimes, I would, uh, when the team left, I would stay behind, even though I was the trip leader, just to talk to the local surgeons. And I realized there was a huge number of unanticipated consequences that were happening. Um, that people uh, came to do this, all, all this uh, free surgery, so they expected all healthcare to be free, which of course it should be for people who have no income or monies, but for people that could afford it perhaps. More importantly is there was complete loss of confidence in all the local surgeons that were very well they were incredibly bright. They had great psychomotor skills. They just needed to learn advanced techniques, that's all. And so they were left out. They were felt put down upon. They were oftentimes not asked to participate. And what they did was just helping because we wanted to get to the next case and the next case. And so although the team felt spectacular, look how many, you know, we, 100 children, we changed their lives in this trip. But meanwhile, the need was going, like this um, in this huge uh, fashion, while at the same time, the numbers that we're treating were very low. So the need became more. So the local people took it for granted. Uh, and then if we stopped going to that country, what happens? Then the need really skyrockets. So I had this epiphany that this is all wrong, that we need to go only if we're doing development uh, and capacity building for this, wherever we go. And I couldn't find any organization that did that. And that was the birth of Plasticos Foundation, which last year we rebranded after 20 years to Mission Plasticos. Uh, but that was the sort of the birthright of how we, how we got to do those things. And I remember um, Paul Newman's from Newman's Own had a little grant and they um, provided a photographer and someone to interview in, in a trip early on in uh, 1997 um, to South Vietnam near the Cambodia border and it eventually won an Academy Award for the best short documentary. Uh, and after that, uh, it seemed that a lot, there were a lot of volunteers. But the early days, you were pretty much doing everything out of your pocket and getting volunteers. But my question to you, because it seems like you come from a family of educators, how was it, how did you educate the volunteers here that were flying over to do the mission with you? I found like-minded individuals, uh, people that I worked with and trained with, and you know, passion begets other passion. And um, it, it's, you know, it was contagious enthusiasm is how I recruited others. And they were just really like-minded. And beforehand, I mentioned, it's, it's not about the number, it's about the number of people we train. And our metric of success is in a lifetime, can they do thousands or tens of thousands of surgeries? You talked about this, the metrics. Was it difficult for you after, you were able to get a lot of volunteers, but was it difficult for you to explain your new metrics for, to organizations for years that had different metri metrics going? 
Well, that's why we start our own organization because a lot of their fundraising, right, it all comes down to dollars. They want to hear what was the impact of my dollar that I gave or my thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars I gave and they want to hear a real number. So yes, it was hard to convince them. But I think if you, you know, took the time to explain what you're doing, then they slowly came around. And you know, the ultimate compliment is when people emulate what you're doing. And sure enough, the other organizations now, many years later, uh, that do reconstructive surgery and, and other types of surgeries, they're now adopting this capacity building model. And so, I mean, that's their best compliment is when people copy you. So I was, I'm thrilled about that. We're going to take a short break. And, but before we take a short break, we want to let people know how they can get in touch with you in your organization. So tell us a little bit about your wonderful executive director, it's not just because we share the same last name, and tell us how we can get in touch with you online. Yes, yeah, so we're extremely fortunate to have Susan Williamson, our executive director. And the best way of reaching her is just through our website, which is missionplascos.org. Thank you, because yep. we'll need that. Yeah. And when we come back, we want to hear about some of these amazing missions that you've done over your two decades. We want to definitely celebrate with you your success that you've done. Oh, I love so, that. So we'll Great. come back in a few minutes and talk about that. Excellent. Thank you. No two days are alike. So every day, you prepare. For yourself. For those you love. For whatever the day may bring. Being prepared is a part of who you are. But in the case of a disaster, Preparation isn't always front of mind. In an emergency, when help and resources may not be available for days, being prepared is more important than ever. It's up to everyone to be informed about what types of emergencies might occur where you live or visit. Knowing the best responses for your personal circumstances is the key to maintaining your health, safety, and independence. Make a plan that covers where you'll go in an emergency and how a personal support network can assist you. Build a kit that contains the specific things you need to survive for several days. Food and water, medication and supplies, as well as any important documents you may need. Being prepared is a part of who you are, and disaster preparation is no different. There's no one more capable of planning for your situation than you. Be informed, make a plan, build a kit, get involved. Ready.gov slash my plan. The worldwide need for health care has evolved in general. And as a surgeon, I realized that 90%, over 90% of all the worldwide need of surgical care in particular is in third world countries. Dr. Nectar, the first half was wonderful. We found out a little bit about you, your background, why you started this phenomenal organization. Now we want to talk about some missions. I'm suggesting Argentina, but you said there's much more. Well, we can certainly start with Argentina, but certainly Mission Plasticos has been all over the world in many different continents. Central America, several different countries, South America, Southeast Asia, India, Nepal, and a host of other countries as well. We also have a domestic program, Reshaping Lives California, which maybe we can even talk about a little bit um, right after I describe some of the countries that we've been in. So Argentina was, uh, is a great example. Um, we uh, have been to a place called Salta, which is way up into the north. Um, it's off the beaten track. Almost all the places we go to are not places the tourists generally go to in, in, in general. 
Uh, it's more of a working class town. And there's some wonderful a group of um, six surgeons uh, plus residents that are relatively young within five years out of their training uh, and just have this passion to learn. The problem is a lot of their training was not, wasn't exactly the same as the training in the States, meaning that although they may have trained in Buenos Aires, it was more of an apprenticeship where they look on and assist and then they're thrust on their own. And depending on the limited faculty that they have, they may not be versed in many different surgeries. And they didn't have the simple tools like this instrument to open up the mouth so you can see when you're operating to fix a cleft palate, for example. So we equipped them with all these tools. They don't do any reconstruction after mastectomies or radiation and so on. And so we're able to bring them all the supplies and tools. But most important, most important is these young, energetic surgeons working at this general hospital that treats everyone of all means is they just wanted to learn. And so the first three days, for example, um, they'd be watching me and the next three days I would do one side and they would do the other side. And then the last three days I'd be cutting stitches and if they got into a little mischief to, to get them out and they felt incredibly comfortable and now they're doing massive amounts of surgery every year of, of types of surgeries that they never would have done before. So the confidence and they, they get back to me all the time, will send me uh, interesting problems with a sketch of how I would do this or that. Um, and I remember there's this little boy with this wide bilateral cleft lip. Um, and uh, to just describe this, you know, if your child is born with a, a cleft, they're, they're ostracized, they're kept in their home for life, which means the mom's kept uh, at home, a family member, so they can't go to the working force. and It affects the whole community. And in just 45 minutes to an hour, the time it takes for me to drive here and back for this interview or go to a movie or a nice dinner in non-COVID times, um, you can change the life of that person and that family and that community. Um, and, for, and three days later, he was back home with a soccer ball. We, we told him we couldn't play, but he had it anyhow back home. Uh, and it just changed his incredible life. I, I can, I'm, I'm happy to share other stories. I could share a story in, from Nepal where we just recently came back uh, in January. There was a little a boy that was very outgoing. He spoke a little English, um, rather than just Nepalese. Uh, and he won a talent uh, contest for Mr. Personality. Incredibly young, young, young boy. And he was in a house fire because most homes, all the heating and cooking is on open fires. And these women wear these, you know, sorry dresses that go up in flames instantly and he fell into the fire and was burned significantly and completely deformed and so you know just with one major uh, you know after he went through all the acute surgery his face was literally melted together and we were able to restore um, a tr in just one, uh, one reconstructive surgery after the initial resuscitation was done of what a, a lot of what this child looks like and and the change is really dramatic and I'm sure I can provide some photos for you to take a look but those are just two examples of what's done every day on the training and the skill sets of the people we work with are incredible it has nothing to do with how well they move their hands it's just learning the, the technique for the first time and become and becoming comfortable with it um, and their motivation, I mean, they're the true heroes. I mean, they're the ones because I, I was there for a short time and every day they're working all day and all night. When we went there was burns in epidemic proportions um, because of uh, the cold winters and how they heat and they, they, they have the first, the biggest burn center in the entire country and we're training their residents and fellows on, on how to do it. I took a lot of the from one of the best burn centers of this country, Harborview up in uh, the Seattle area, critical care experts, and critical care anesthesiologists, uh, burn surgeons, um, burn occupational therapists, things. They, there is no occupational therapist for the entire country, so we just trained a whole new set. Um, we brought a biomedical engineer. We're starting that whole program. I don't know any uh, group that's doing it in reconstructive surgery because all this expensive equipment, if it's not maintained, They'll never have the money to buy another one, and they teach them how to do these things. So that's just a few of the examples of things that we do. 
So you had this vision 20 years ago to make sure that when you went to do a mission at this place that you were able to train people and leave them there with those skills that they can continue on. And so now we're 20 years later, you're starting to see that. How does, how does that make you feel as one of the founders of this organization? Uh, well, tremendous, but uh, <laughs> just to give you a, a, a concrete example. Yes. So, you know, we live by that old Chinese adage, you know, um, give a man a fishing pole and, yeah. you know, you can give him a fish, you can feed him for a day, teach him how to fish, he can fish yeah, for a lifetime. Fish for a lifetime. Yes. If you can teach him how to fish and train others how to fish, which isn't part of that adage, uh, no, then it becomes part. exponential. So when we went to Argentina, for example, yes. I originally went uh, during our first few years to Guatemala for a few times. And there's this one wonderful doctor, Dr. Ernesto Cofino, who's well trained, but he's operating by himself. And he wanted to learn some advanced techniques and some you know, surgeries he was seeing a lot of. And so once we trained him, he is now training others. And he was one of the faculty members that I brought with me. So we were both faculty now, training the others in Argentina. So that is the exponential factor. That's where all of a sudden it grows and grows mm -hmm. and everyone's doing it. And he has his own nonprofit organization as well. Um, in, his, in Guatemala, which again is the biggest compliment ever. So it's that exponential effect that really is spectacular. And that's, you know, we um, train, um, uh, teach, and transform the lives, not of just the patient's retreat, mm -hmm. but the surgeons we influence, influence others, as it turns out, ourselves as well. As it's a complicated way of answering your question. No. and. It's not complicated. In fact, what you're showing us is the groundwork of this wonderful vision that you had, but your vision is now brought into reality and it's paying itself forward because the people that you're training, they are taking what you're training them to be and they are training others. Exactly. And so is that, was that the big vision that you had or it was just so much more? Well, it always was, you know, of course, uh, it continues to expand yeah. and we'll, unless others sort of copy what we're doing and, and we can expand on a much greater level, it'll be very tough. I just came back in late February and early March, just as COVID was hitting the country to do site visits in Tanzania and in Kenya, uh, where they just started their first plastic surgical training program uh, about five years ago. So they're just about to graduate their first residence. Uh, and in some of these countries, there's only a handful of plastic surgeons for a population of 40 or 45 million. To put in perspective, uh, for many years, I was chairman of plastic surgery at Hogue Hospital in Orange County. There's 97 plastic surgeons, probably the largest in the world in this 400 bed hospital. And I just said, there's probably only six well-trained plastic surgeons in Tanzania for a population of over 45 million. It's unbelievable what they're so, I mean, the work that has to be done is just incredible. And how do you think you can continue some of this work? Because everything, we can't really travel right now. So do you want to, are you waiting until we're done? We're able to go and travel again? It sounds like some of the doctors are even contacting you by email. So tell us a little bit about that. That's a great question. So Thank you. Uh, I can answer in a few different ways. I love uh, it. One is we have a domestic program, Reshaping Lives California. Um, and it turns out in this p political climate, unstable economics, there's a tremendous um, watershed population that are just, they can't afford surgery. They're afraid that they'll be deported. They may have a breast cancer that could kill them. They may have other sorts of problems. They may have an injury that they can't if simply fix. They could start using their hands again and go right back to work. And they're afraid to seek medical care. Or they may be you know, ill and things I don't deal with infectious diseases and that spreads tremendously. So a few years back, we started Reshaping Lives California and uh, we were able to get a surgery center that will volunteer their time and we have nurses and doctors and we, right here at home, we started that, this program. That's ongoing right now. Secondly is, um, you know, we were committed to go back to Nepal and this 
hospital was just overwhelmed. I mean, they had, it was a mass unit with the, when, during the burn season. There were just stretchers in hallways of critical care patients. It was just, oh, it just grabbed at your heartstrings, that's for sure. And so um, the monies that would have been spent uh, this year that we fundraised hard and long for, we're uh, trying to partner with other people and build a whole s set of surgical suites, four separate operating rooms just for burn surgery and plastic surgery and critical care area and, and build it from the ground up. We still have a long ways to go there, but uh, we have enough money to start that whole project. So we just have looked at the architectural renderings um, and we're pretty much ready to go and, and that's what we're doing right now. But until we have a COVID vaccine, uh, you know, I have to look after the people that, uh, my volunteers would love to go right now, but we don't want to make other people sick and, and I have to look after the safety and welfare of, of our team members as well. But we have lots to do, uh, that's for sure. And every week I get these photographs of these difficult cases and, and calls back and forth. And through telemedicine, we're uh, on doing ongoing educational series as well as helping them with difficult cases. So right now, there's probably people at home viewing this and they want to be able to help you, even though they know you can't go out right now, but you have plans to build this hospital. They want to help you right now. So how can they reach you again? The best way is just going to our website, missionplasticos.org. That's uh, Plasticos is spelled P-L-A-S-T-I-C-O-S. Thank you so much for your time and this special segment that you were telling us about your mission. It is incredible. And thank you so much, Dr. Nectar, for coming on this edition of Everybody. Thank you, it was my distinct pleasure, Angela. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Everybody with Angela Williamson. Viewers like you make this show possible. Stay in touch with us on social media. Good night and stay well.